Um, so why don't we now uh, talk about the exhibition? So it would be great to understand how you, how you have both structured the exhibition and why you've chosen to focus on um, her, li her, her life in this, in this way. And, and, and yeah, let's talk about the structure of the exhibition. Uh, so we wanted, as I mentioned, we wanted to give people a sense of how she got to where she is now. So we felt it was important to give a sense of her history, which is very long, you know, seven decades worth, and to really trace the development of, I guess, the motifs that we felt people knew, which was the dots and the nets. Um, so the first section, because our, our space had three different galleries, or four actually, um, so we kind of structured each thematically. So the first one was to try and trace those motifs from the early 50s, you know, from the very first, almost like self-portraits where she'd cover herself with dots, to the net paintings. Um, and the dots, in a sense, are the inverse of the nets. It's almost the space in between the nets. So they're very connected. Um, and then the pumpkins, which is a really, I mean, it connects to her childhood, but also sexuality. Um, which sort of led us into the next section, which was looking at um, the body and the way she worked with these bodily forms, this anxiety about sex, as Adele mentioned, um, but also her performance work. And, um, and then that way of activating the audience, um, activating space, then led us into the final section, which was really the installations and environments, which is, I guess, what people knew her for. I think to keep the structure fairly open-ended, so from the infinity nets to the Mayatona soul, these are painting series that still continue, right? She, it hasn't ended. You know, you would think that having infinity nets in the early section kind of means that she's done with it, but she still continues to paint them till today. Yeah, and you'll see some fantastic examples in the Machan show. Yeah, so we want to see, we wanted to present a, a vital and vibrant artist that is kind of, um, not yet kind of um, declared, kind of finished, right? Uh, that she may be old, but she is vital and contemporary. So there was a, um, a wish to still show that she is relevant for today's audience. How would you describe it? Um, well, on a very superficial level, you know, she's, you know, has this tremendous presence. Uh, uh, whose works feature so much on social media. She's so photogen. well, the works are so photogenic. But at the same time, um, the historical component for me was, I think, one of the true um, high points for, in the exhibition for me. Um, because they remind us of the urgent work that artists still have to do today. Because we also touched on the period of the 60s with the civil rights movement in the United States, the protests at Wall Street um, against the Vietnam War. Uh, these are things that are still relevant today. So I think that's a kind of opportunity um, for her work from before to trans, um, transverse these time periods and still speak to today's audiences because I think some of the issues are still germane. Yeah. So I think there, are, in this exhibition, there are a number of themes that are very strong that that, that emerge actually throughout the entire um, throughout the entire sec seven decades of work. So things like, of course, the nets, um, obliteration. That there are mirrors. There are um, se a sense of infinity. I mean, these, these are concepts that which you can see right from the very early stages. I'm wondering if you could expand more on what some of her key concepts are, or the key takeaways that, that, that an audience might, might take from looking at the exhibition as a whole. Okay, well I'll pick up on the infinity, I guess, which is very in interconnected um, with a number of her ideas. So, and I guess people really respond to the infinity rooms. Um, so she's, I mean, she has this sense that she's just um, at one, in a sense, one dot within this, the universe. So she sees this very um, interconnected kind of experience. So the, the sort of depersonalization kind of hallucinations and so on she was having as a child, I think, also made her feel like she was sort of melting into her environment. So these screens or these sort of net imagery that she used to see meant that everything became sort of integrated in a sense. So she was able to kind of turn that 
um, quite terrifying experience, I think, into something that I guess fused with almost this Buddhist idea of um, being at one with the universe. And she was also very part of the, I guess, the 60s generation, the sort of tune-in dropout. So there's a whole lot of different elements that kind of fuse. And she was very much involved in that ca countercultural moment in the 60s. You know, she took LSD, um, you know, the, she was involved in these happenings. So all of these different aspects kind of connect, I think. And um, I think she's, she's able to find these very quite simple but incredibly effective um, techniques like the reflecting mirrors that reflect each other and then into infinity to kind of represent that experience. But they're also not new ideas either. I mean, mm. these are things that she was experimenting around in the 60s. So yeah. Even though the, the infinity rooms are very new. And the, yeah, but she made her first one in, yeah. six, in the early 60s. 65, yeah. the Fally room. Yeah. 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 Um, One more thing that I kind of wanted to also add on is because um, you, you kind of sense an obsessive repetition of forms. Uh, the aggregation and accumulation are words that she uses to describe her titles. Um, but she was also deeply kind of um, petrified of this uh, society of standardization, right? So in that 60s period, she also used lots of like macaroni shapes. Um, the uniformly cut, you know, um, pasta shapes that is emblematic of her, of this kind of uh, uniform systemization, systemization of uh, society. Uh, so in order to kind of, um, kind of speak against that, I think she uses those materials incessantly and obsessively over and over again. But at the same time, I think she also is speaking to our own neuroses, our, you know, our psychic structures in these kind of capitals, capitalistic societies. And, you know, she tries to reflect on this, but at the same time pushes it to like the nth extreme. So that it kind of like, you know, um, to a point where you just can't contain it anymore, right? That it becomes this um, almost abject um, overflowing thing. And that overcomes you. So she was actually, to me, trying to give a different vision uh, for humanity. Yeah. Um, I suppose what one thing about that period uh, in New York in the in the sixties and seventies is uh, how important it is to the development of contemporary art. So can you talk a little bit about her relationships with other artists? Um, I know that some of them, the early, early relationship with Georgia O'Keeffe, of course, is very important in her development as a, uh, and her self-confidence as, as, as an artist. But what about the other, other relationships? And also, what was her relationship to the rest of the scene like at that, at that period? Because even though we see Kasama as being this phenomenon, like, you know, she's very famous, um, a very, an artist who who people would instantly recognize whether or not they're a part of the art world or not. She, she wasn't always like that. So I'm curious about maybe fleshing out the, um, uh, that pro firstly her relationships with artists and then also that process by which she has become that kind of phenomenon um, that, we, that we know of her now. Um, well in New York, I guess she very quickly fell in with the group um, I mean, she was sharing studio spaces and so on with people like Donald Judd, um, Eva Hesse, uh, uh, Carl Andre, Frank Stella. She was exhibiting with them. She was in an exhibition with Klaus Oldenburg and uh, Andy Warhol in '62, which is now considered probably the first pop art show, and that's where she introduced her soft sculptures. Um, so it was a very fertile moment um, at the time, and. Uh, she was very supported. She found a lot of support from a few key figures, like O'Keefe, of course, was the first one. Uh, Judd was the second, probably, and he reviewed her very first exhibition, because at that time he was probably more of a critic than an artist. Um, so they really helped sustain her. I mean, they um, and different artists would give her money, help feed her. Um, it was uh, mental. So yeah. Lucio Fontana yeah. also lent her money yeah. to produce the mirror balls for the Narcissus Garden. Yeah, so she was able to build these very um, close relationships and strong networks. And her longest personal relationship was with Joseph Cornell, 
um, who also was quite, I mean, you can see that in her collage works, for example, how that dialogue uh, went on with her. Um, but when she went back to Japan in 73, um, it was very difficult. I think she felt very alienated from the Japanese art world. Um, she was seen as quite scandalous. Um, she'd done these happenings and so on, and that got quite a lot of publicity in Japan. It shocked her family. It got a lot of negative press. And she was kind of a pariah, I think, for about 10 years or so um, when she got back. So that was a very difficult period. But I think it was also a period where she made some of the most interesting work because it's very strange. And she'd had a couple of breakdowns around that time. So I think she was really um, pushing you know, and experimenting. She did a lot of writing at that time as well. I also want to point to um, not just America but to Europe. So in the late 60s, she was also showing in Germany and the Netherlands quite a bit. She fell into also with the, uh, the Knoll group, the Zero Artists. Um, another avant-garde set in Europe, which were also exploring new ways of making art. Uh, they also used lots of mirrors, interestingly, at that time, uh, and kinetic work. So um, to me, I don't think um, Kusama was just kind of alone making that type of work. She suddenly was in conversation with the uh, larger, you know, avant-garde scene globally, or at least in Europe. Uh, and these were important, I think, um, cross-cultural influences, yeah, that often kind of go unremarked. Uh, and in this exhibition, you will also see um, three cage paintings. Actually, these, these are pretty rare. Um, the only... Um, I think were only ever made in 1970, and there were only about 14 to 15 of them. Uh, so they're reminiscent also the cage effect, the wire netting. It's also reminiscent of the infinity nets that she did. But also the fact that um, she doesn't really do portraits, but you realize these are actually known uh, women. And she's spoken about them as her bad girls series. Um, in a way, she's also reflecting on herself as a potential bad girl, you know. Uh, you know, these are women who have transgressed, you know, but act have actually been also kind of locked in um, and caged in um, by um, the perceptions of society and kind of almost not allowed to kind of rise to their fullest potential. But, yeah, so I think there was... Uh, with that set of work, I think there was a moment where I could even say she was feminist. What's interesting too, I think, that carries through her whole life and her whole career is the sense that she's very much an individualist. She's not a joiner. I mean, you can see her work connecting to pop, to minimalism, to all these other movements, zero in Europe. Um, she made very strong connections with those artists, but she never became part of any of those movements. And she's always resisted conformity, like from the expectations of her family as a child to even, she's often rejected the label of feminism too, even though you could see that she's definitely an inspiration for female artists, but she's never wanted to have that label. So she's always, um, yeah, kind of always been very strongly that it's her um, rather than part of a, a movement or a group. I read in an interview somewhere that this kind of disavowal of the term feminism has much to do with her own relationship with her mother. It's funny that, um, yeah, she was kind of sent by her mother to spy on her father, which she completely hated. And eventually the relationship, the parental relationship was actually stronger with the father than the mother. So uh, to her, there was this um, demonic figure a demonic maternal figure, which I think kind of stopped her from uh, kind of fully embracing, you know, uh, the feminist that is, I think, latent in her. Well, that's my reading, at least. I mean, I think from my, one of the readings that I have as well is that here is a, a woman who's in total control of her practice, yeah. in total control of her body, her money, her relationships. I mean, I think that if not a feminist, I think uh, at least a very, very strong, strong woman. Um, and I think uh, perhaps younger artists can really look up to and learn a lot from that, from that determination. So that, let's now turn to, I mean, this, the, the, I think for our audiences, that we're not yet accustomed to 
big complex shows like this here in Indonesia. So let's talk about the nuts and bolts of actually making making an exhibition. How how long was the research process, and what what is the first step for a curator to um, propose to do an exhibition with an icon like this? Right. Yeah. yeah, we were sort of in competition with a major retrospective in Japan, which sucked up all a lot of these works that we were aiming for, which was very frustrating. But I mean, she's so prolific mm -hmm. that you can do several surveys at the same time, and you still have important work. Um, but it did take away, you know, opportunities for a number of works that we were hoping for. Um, but yeah, we were able to find good examples of the key moments uh, we felt that was able to track, you know, that that story. As, as as well as we could. Um, we also have quite particular spaces, so when you're curating a show, you have to think about the space, the scale of the space, um, how people move through. Um, so we found quite a clear narrative. As I mentioned, we had these thematic sections. Um, but we also had the City Hall Chamber, which is a very beautiful sort of historic room, which was perfect to, yeah, it's in one of the slides there, which has the silver balls, the Narcissus Garden piece. So we also wanted to create an experience um, that was very particular in that space as well. So we chose a certain, you know, a particular work for that, as well as the um, Dot's Obsession, which you'll see upstairs, the big yellow balloons, which we placed in the entrance atrium. So as soon as you walk in, you see, um, a bit like you see here, these, these, this beautiful kind of installation. So it instantly draws people in. So there's all these different considerations, you know, how much space do we have? Um, what is available, um, and then what do we really want to highlight. And I guess also with the performance works, we felt it was important in Singapore to highlight that period because performance in Singapore and in Southeast Asia is very important. And we felt that artists and the art community would maybe connect to that particular point, you know, these ideas of doing public performance, making social commentary um, would resonate um, particularly to this region. But it was actually quite hell, hellish um, making the, the show work in a um, colonial building. Because <laughs> we actually, with the show, we realized, you know, all the idiosyncrasies that we had with our old building. Um, the floors are not level, so when you entered, you realize you're entering up a ramp. Uh, the um, balls in the um, city hall chamber uh, had to be individually secured with the kind of a rubber donut at the bottom to prevent them from rolling off because our floors are not level. So if you can imagine how much work was involved in making 1,500 rubber donuts and placing them underneath. Yeah. So like these moments of like um, tensions and don't, not knowing whether it will work and whether it will, you know, a slight, you know, a couple of degrees off will tilt the whole thing. Um, so even in the um, My Eternal Soul room, uh, I think there was a 10 to 15 degree difference from one end of the room to the next. So when we were trying to hang the paintings, um, we were deliberating uh, the baseline on which to use that would just kind of create the illusion that it's all okay. Well, it's good to know that the National Gallery has struggles with um, 